Oh yeah, I do have like a little. Should I put it like on the? N Cause yeah, it's probably gonna bump around. Mm -hmm. How about that? Is that? Is that good? Does that work? Yeah. Perfect. Cool. Sorry. If I'm saying you've done stand up paddle bowl, is that a designer of stand up paddle bowl? Writer, probably. Writer. Probably the best. Cool. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Great. So are we good to go? Yeah. Okay. So can we hear anything? Not yet. Just a moment. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. So welcome all to the last Games Now lecture uh, of this academic year from Aalto University. And uh, welcome to those of you who are here and those who are watching the stream or, or watching the video later on on the internet. And uh, we have an interesting guest here today. So we have Davy Ridden, <laughs> from, uh, who's been uh, the writer of Stanley Parable. And uh, it's a really interesting topic with how, how stories and, and games go together. And uh, uh, this has been a really interesting case lately, so really interested to see what Davy has to tell us. Welcome. Thank go you. For it. Thank you. Uh, hi. hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Davy, as you said. Uh, I'm actually just curious, before starting this, how many people are students here at the university? Most of you, awesome. How many people are studying games, games or game design? Oh, actually only a few of you. So the vast, so the majority of you are doing stuff other than games. Really, that's interesting. Uh, are there any non-student just developers, game developers around? No, so this is, like, oh, we've got one. Okay, so this is like all students from various things. That's actually really cool. Thank you so much for coming to this talk uh, about Stanley Parable. Um, I, I assume that at least some of you, do, have, have people played, who's played Stanley Parable? Who knows what this is about? Okay, cool, so like actually the majority of you don't, don't know this. That's perfect, that's really good. Um, I, this, this will be fun, this will be a fun talk. Uh, unfortunately, so I, like, I don't really have a PowerPoint or anything because I, I wrote the talk and then the to uh, PowerPoint wasn't right for it. So I have this nice image up here. This is, this is an image from Stanley Parable um, and it's uh, representative of what making video games is like. It's pretty much just this. Um, yeah, uh, okay, so cool. Thank you very much for all of you showing up and uh, I'll, say, I'll say the things that I wrote down. Um, okay. So um, on July 15th, 2014, I got an email from Alex. Is Alex is here somewhere? Where is he? He's running around. He's, okay, okay, cool. So uh, Alex is, of course, one of the organizers of the Game Now program. And, uh, and in, in his email, he tells me about Alto University and about the Games Now speaker series. And he tells me that he's interested um, in having me talk to the students about game narrative and storytelling and about the making of the Stanley Parable. Three weeks before I got that email, on uh, June 23rd, 2014, I had begun going to therapy for depression and anxiety. I was at a point in my life where I felt I had no one who was going to continue to be there for me. Every day my emotional state was wildly different. I felt cold and disconnected from the world and was generally just in a mindset of wanting everyone and everything to go away. So I get an email from Alex. Do you want to come to, uni to a university and give a talk? Do you want to tell students about game design, about storytelling, about process? And I start wondering, what do I want to say to a group of university students? If I wanted to put something in their heads that would actually matter to them, what would it be? If I could tell them something that would shape them going forward, possibly in some way, or if that would in, in some way affect the course of their game development or whatever it is that, uh, that the rest of you are studying, um, that would have some impact on them, what would I want to come and say? Well, what if I talked about Stanley Parable's development? I could tell them stories of the design and of the process and how we got to many of the stories that are in the game. Like, for instance, how one of the central features of the game was added only by accident. So um, there's, a, there's an office that you continue to come back to over and over throughout the game, and uh, the layout of the office often changes at random. 
and uh, each time that you play through it. And originally, this was a feature that we added because we were afraid that, be that players would become really bored by having to walk through the same office halls over and over. And so really, it was just meant as a deterrent against fatigue. Like, oh, look at this new little thing. Come, in, come and uh, explore like, what's different now. Uh, it wasn't until we actually put that randomization in the game that we realized that it was becoming a central feature in many players' experiences of the game. They thought that it was meant to be a part of the central narrative that like, the office layout was changing. And of course, we didn't tell anyone that this was not intentional. We just sort of went, oh, yeah, that's, that's the thing you remember most from your experience? All right, cool, yeah, that's what it was we meant to do that. Uh, so the takeaway is that you create better experiences for your players when you let go of the effect that you intended for something to have and simply listen to the experience that your players are actually having and develop uh, the game to support that instead. Or I could tell you about a section of game where you throw yourself off a platform repeatedly while the narrator in your ear begs you not to. And how originally it was exactly the same except that the narrator had trapped you here and was forcing you to throw yourself over and over. And players hated it. They hated that they were being coerced into an action and that they couldn't do anything about it. And when the only change that we made was we reversed the dialogue and made the narrator upset about what you were doing, people suddenly loved it. So we learned that it wasn't the specific action that they were doing that was important, it was what they were being told about why that action was important in the first place. In this case, purely by framing the player action as rebellious, the action itself became enjoyable. It was as simple as changing the tone of the voiceover. So either of those anecdotes, and many, many, many more, could each be the subject of its own talk that I might hypothetically deliver to you today. So I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to talk about design, or narrative, or production, or storytelling, and here's why. This is a room full of university students heading off into the world to make games, or whatever it is that you're studying, and to do great things. You're at the start of something, and you have so, so, so much time ahead of you. And that means that right now, today, you're in a position where the things that you think about are going to trickle down through all of your work to come. You know, what you think about today will affect the, the things that you make a month from now. And then the things that you make a month from now will affect the things that you think about two months from now. And then that will affect the stuff you make after that, and so on and so forth in this cycle. So the question is, what do you want to think about? What's important? What's so important that it's worth influencing the entire cycle of things that you make for the rest of your lives? And, and you know, I don't, by this, I don't mean what's your idea for a game. I mean what's important in your life. And I'm not saying that I don't enjoy talking about design and structure and narrative and all that fun stuff. In fact, we're going to do a Q&A after this, and I'm sure that uh, you know, some of you will have questions for me along the lines of the very, uh, thing, the very topics that I just mentioned here. And, and I'm really looking forward to it. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm going, to, I'm going to propose to you that beyond all of the designs and the systems and the mechanics and the rewards and the structure and the choices and the narrative, that there is something tremendously more important to think about when it comes to doing creative work. And it has, uh, uh, it has to do with the deeper reasons for why you're doing the creative work that you're doing. The deeper reason behind creative work is unfortunately something that almost no one who makes creative work ever thinks about. It is so vast and so important that 99% of people will never even notice that it's there. It's hidden by virtue of its size. The deeper reason is also entirely personal to you. So the best that I can really do uh, is to show you what it looks like for me in as much detail as I can to help give you a reference point for how to see it in your own life. It's very difficult to bring this huge invisible thing into focus. But if and when you do, as I hope you all do, what you find on the other end is an incredible amount of personal fortitude, well-being, happiness, and the strength to create beautiful, beautiful art. So now let's get dirty. I'm going to try to convince you that the kind of game you make is way less important than the reason that you made it, which of course is a very simple thing to say, and Alto University paid several hundred euros to fly me out here, and they put me up in a very lovely hotel not too far from the city center, and uh, so I think I owe it to them to get much more specific and much more personal about why the kind of game that you make is less important than the reason that you made it. So in order to convince you of this, I'm going to tell you a story about a thing that happened to me. Uh, I'm going to tell you about my life in a lot of detail that makes me kind of uncomfortable to dredge up after all this time, but it's important. And it's not important that I was depressed or that I did some shitty things to myself. It's important to think about why I did those things. And if you can go to this place, if you can really see the why, why did I do this, 
then you begin walking the road to clarity that will strengthen you as an artist in a way that nothing else in the world can. Okay, so let's talk about launching the Stanley Parable. It launched in 2013, but things had been building up to that launch for quite some time. In 2011, I had put a free Half-Life 2 mod out onto the internet, also called the Stanley Parable, that was essentially a prototype for the full release in 2013. Before that, I was at film school at USC in Los Angeles. I had been making stuff for years. I wrote silly parody songs for a mock folk band in high school. I made animated short movies, which I put on Newgrounds. I wrote a series of uh, vignette-style short stories on my own in college. At film school, I made a bunch of movies, some of which I liked. None of the movies that I liked were also the ones that my professors liked. Basically, I had been making stuff for years and not really ever gotten much response. I would have some friends who liked my work, sure, but nothing really beyond that. Some of you may resonate with this. While I know that I was never doing it, any of it just to get recognized, it's really hard to separate your creative work from your ego. No matter how much that you really believe it's just for you, just for your own personal pleasure, eventually you find yourself looking around and thinking, does anyone else like this? Do you guys think this is cool? I think this is cool. What do you think? Do you, what, what do you, what do you, and you, and you want that. It's impossible not to have those thoughts, or it's impossible for me anyway. But you keep making stuff anyway because you love it. You know, you, you can't help yourself, you just have to do this. Every time that you make something special that gets completely ignored, you use it as fuel to prove them wrong the next time. And you do this over and over and over until maybe one day you're like me and you decide that you're just not really cut out to be the creative type and maybe you plan to go into a different field. I was literally weeks away from abandoning game development and just running a bar somewhere when the free version of Stanley Parable hit the internet and suddenly overnight I had tens of thousands of eyes on me. So wow, what does that do to a person? I had convinced myself that my sensibilities just weren't cut out for public consumption and I probably wouldn't ever really have an audience and suddenly I'm given the audience that I'd been dreaming of for years. It was validation like you cannot even imagine. For a few weeks there after the game came out, I was a god. I felt like I could not fail, that anything I made was instant gold. And remember, this was my very first video game. So as far as I was concerned, I had a 100% smash hit record. It was amazing, and I learned pretty fast that I was not a god. Uh, the, the thing that happened uh, after the game came out that's the clearest and most painful memory of learning just how human I actually was, uh, shortly after the game came out, these guys from a you know, like slightly well-known gaming podcast contacted me about going on their show and doing an interview, and I'm thinking to myself, Yes, here it is. I get to be center stage, finally. I will, you know, descend from my mountain and deliver the commandments of game design to these peons or whatever. Uh, I had never been so excited for something to finally be given personal recognition. And I went on the podcast and the interview was like an hour and a half and oh my God, I did not shut up. I just fucking talked and talked and talked and I think they got to ask me like six questions total. I had to say, everything, right? It was so bad, it was really, really bad. And I got off the call and I just felt so empty, so incredibly empty, I cannot tell you. Uh, it was like this was the one thing that I'd been waiting for. And I so completely indulged myself in it with no wiggle room and I came away from it with no satisfaction whatsoever. And it felt awful, you know, like I'd been lied to. Like this thing that I had really wanted, really wanted to be interviewed and to be asked my opinions, that it had given me no comfort whatsoever. I was really sad about that, and I decided I would never listen to the podcast again. Uh, though actually, uh, last year I, I did go back and I, I listened to it again for the fir very first time. It was pretty much just as bad as I remembered. Um, I had all these weird little quirks during the interview, like oftentimes after saying something very snooty and pretentious about game design or life or whatever, uh, I would then say something to the effect of, but of course, it's not like I'm a genius of game design. Uh, and then oftentimes after saying that, I would follow it up with, but, you know, half a million people have played my game, so, you know, I'm probably doing pretty good. Oh, oh, it was really bad, very bad. Uh, so anyway, uh, please don't look that up. Um, so, so I did that interview, and after that, I calmed myself down a bit. Uh, I kept doing some interviews, but, you know, I was, like, kind of getting better at them. And not long after that, I found a young guy in England named William Pugh, and the two of us began working together on the uh, high-definition remake of the game. Okay, so I want to pause for a second. Let's look back at what I've just told you so far about the original Stanley Parable, about who I was going into that and how I responded to it. Why did I make that game? 
Why did I spend two years killing myself over that mod? Well, there's no simple answer to that. For one thing, uh, one big piece is that I really wanted to get a job at Valve, which for those who don't know is a very large uh, game development company. And I was hoping that this game would make for a good resume piece. But is that the only reason? I know that a few of you have played Stanley Parable, so of course you know, uh, uh, but for those who don't, that it's about a man who discovers that he's all alone, everything that he thought would be there for him has left, he's given no choice but to wander the empty halls of his office alone, searching aimlessly, given no solace but the voice in his own head. So again, why did I make Stanley Parable? It's because I was alone. I felt very, very alone. And it's not like I didn't have friends, you know, I had great friends. And yet the burning thing on my mind was the story of this man who's completely, vastly alone. It wasn't enough just to have friends. I wanted to be seen. I wanted to be liked for some much grander reason. I wanted to be told that I was great. I wanted to hear, uh, overhear a conversation on the bus. Hey, Davey Reedon's got a new game out. What a genius. What a paragon of brilliant narrative design. I wanted to be made complete through the validation of someone else. A few months after the game came out, I talked to a friend who, uh, who described, the way he described it was that Stanley Parable had been like me reaching out into the void, and by some improbable means, the void had reached back. And to be sure, uh, you know, I got, a lot of, uh, I got a lot out of the reception to that game. I made a ton of friends. I moved to Austin, where I live now, uh, moved in with the people that I live with today. I made friends and lovers and found a whole community. But the reception to the original mod was, while it was big, it was not exactly overwhelming. I dealt with it. You know, I kept making games. I'd gotten quite a bit of validation from the experience, to be sure. But in some way, it still wasn't enough. There could be more. I knew there could be more, and I continued to pursue it. And again, there were so many reasons why I was making this thing and why William and I both continued pushing so hard all that time, but undeniably I had gotten a taste of being in the spotlight, this thing I'd never had before, and I wanted more than anything for it to continue. So I kept making the new game with my partner William, and we worked on it for two years. Uh, by the way, a funny note is that William and I never actually met in person for that entire time. The whole thing was done just over Skype uh, voice call, no, no video. We met in person for the first time a month after the game launched. Um, anyway, so it's a long and difficult battle to get the game made, and then in October 2013, we finally do it. We launched the first commercial video game that either of us had ever made, and it was a crazy smash hit, to the complete and total surprise of both of us. Um, so we'd actually had a number in mind for like the total amount of the game selling like in its entire lifetime that would mean that we would be able to keep doing this and to, you know, pursuing whatever it was that we wanted to do, uh, and that would be like the number that would make us the total happiest uh, for all the work that we'd put in, and we hit that number in the first 24 hours. So overnight, our work became a kind of phenomenon, and the two of us were at the center of it. In fact, primarily, I was at the center of it, largely because I had been the sole creator of the original game, and so as a result, many media outlets focused more on me as the face of the operation. My email address was the one on the website, so I received 100% of the inquiries about the game. Okay, so, now here's where things are gonna start to get dirty and where we need to ask some very important questions about why did things go this way. You may be noticing two details about the story that have the potential to converge in an interesting way. One is that I wanted to be recognized and validated personally for my work, and the other is that I had an open line of communication to anyone who wanted to get in touch with me when the game launched. Now you might look at these two details and say, gosh, that sounds great. Sounds like everything is going to work out really awesome for you. And in theory, yes, you're right, but the problem is that validation is not a vaccine. You don't just take it once and then the disease goes away. You have to keep taking it, like hunger. It returns every single day. You cannot sate the desire to be praised. In fact, the very opposite. The more you feed it, the stronger it grows. I was going into this launch trying to get something that you actually cannot get, to be 100% validated by others. So the response starts coming in, and at first everything seems like it's going great. In fact, when I tell you that I was deeply depressed for months after Stanley Parable came out, at the time, I'm not sure I would have thought of it that way. You know, like I was getting, I was getting uh, requests for interviews, to be on podcasts and web shows, I was getting messages and emails from people who had incredible experiences with the game, people who wanted to put it in museums and festivals, people wanted me to come and give talks for them or to submit the game to their awards, publishers are reaching out to me about potential deals, distributors want to partner with us, holy crap, this is it, this is the promised land, I can do anything, I can have anything. I responded to all of them. I responded to every single email. 
I assembled paperwork and art assets for festivals that wanted to show the game. I got on calls with every person who asked to do an interview. I wrote long email responses to every person who sent me written interview requests, uh, questions. I sent out a dozen copies of the game for review every single day. I accepted every opportunity to travel somewhere to give a talk. I got on phone calls with every publisher who wanted to chat. I responded to every single email that people wrote me, every single one, every email where they told me about their experiences with the game, told me about their lives and what they'd been thinking about lately and what was scaring them and about the games that they were trying to make and their own ideas and their careers and their hopes and asking for advice and friendship and comfort and I responded to every single one of those emails. Hundreds of them in a few days or weeks or however long it was. This was my life. I didn't do other things. I pretty much just responded to emails. And the tough thing about this scenario is that as long as you're even looking at the email subject line, your brain automatically gets invested in the contents of the email, especially when you see it's a personalized email, right? Like something if someone actually typed to you and didn't just send in batch. Your brain pumps just like this very small amount of adrenaline through your body every time you even look at the email. You don't even have to respond. It takes that small amount of energy just to acknowledge the person on the other end, to listen to what they have to say, to relate to them, to feel their life pulsating. Even if they don't get real deep in the email, you know, they might even write you like 10 words, but because you know so little about this person, you start trying to fill in all these other details about them and projecting yourself onto them. Uh, and then when you actually respond to that email, it takes even more of your energy. It's amazing how when there is someone else trying to connect, you automatically give them a piece of yourself. You can't not. You know, how could you not? I'm sure some of you may have had an experience like this before. Um, uh, you know, like maybe you're at a party and someone starts talking to you and, and they seem genuinely interested in talking and maybe right at this moment you're tired or you've got something else big on your mind right now or you generally just don't like talking to people at parties or maybe it's really loud in this room uh, and you wouldn't think you'd have the energy to talk to this person. But, be, you know, because they seem like really genuinely eager to talk to you of all people, you just get like sucked into it and that energy is infectious, you know, and from somewhere inside of you, you find the energy and then you're having that conversation. Right? Now, it's not like you're expecting an hour-long conversation with this person, so you can give them you know, just like a small amount of your energy and, and you'll feel just fine with it. Okay, now imagine that you show up at the party and you're tired or it's loud or you've got something else on your mind and there are 200 people who all want to have that conversation with you. And yes, you could turn around and just leave the party, go back home where it's quiet, except for one very big problem. This is what you've always wanted. You know it. You know in your heart of hearts that you have always wanted this, for everyone at the party to come to you. You've been dreaming of this for years. You don't have the energy, so what? This is what you always wanted. This is why you started making games in the first place, isn't it? Isn't this why you've been making stuff? So that you could be at the party and 200 people would all want to talk to you? That sounds great. You have to talk to all of them. You have to. Talking to them is the only important thing. It's the only thing that matters. You've been telling yourself this for years. Talking to them is the only thing that matters. I hope you can see the dots that I'm trying to connect here. I was driving myself into the ground trying to respond to absolutely every piece of communication that came my way. And it wasn't an isolated incident. It wasn't like this had just come out of nowhere. I had been setting myself up for this for years. The intention, one of the big reasons that I'd been making games, was to be liked. I had defined that goal so strongly and so monolithically that there was no room for other things like, I don't know, self-care or mental health. No, be liked, be praised, make connections, talk to people. There was no limit to it. This won't end, just be liked forever, infinitely. That's the rest of your life. Spend all of your energy, every ounce of strength that you have. It's all worth it. This was my why. This was the purpose that drove me. And now this is where things start to get kind of hairy. And when I talk to you about the, the depression that resulted from this, I'd like to clarify something. Today, I'm doing great. I really am. I climbed up out of it. I mended all my relationships with people. I still go to therapy. I'm without a doubt the happiest I've ever been in my life by far. So when I tell you about these things that happened to me a year and a half ago, I'm not asking for your pity or your sympathy. I'm relaying this to you to try to illustrate for you what is at risk. If you're not being mindful about why you're making the things that you're making, what do you stand to lose? How bad could it really be? Well, things got really bad for me uh, a week or two after the game launched. 
We had this very minor controversy where someone pointed out that a piece of imagery used in the game was racially insensitive, and I agreed and said I would change it. And then the person who had pointed, out, who had pointed that out went and talked to the press, who asked me for a quote. And you know, again, here I am in this mindset of all recognition is good, talk to everyone, so I did. And then the story circulated, and suddenly I'm receiving dozens of pieces of hate mail from people who thought that I was buckling to politically cor uh, correct propaganda and sacrificing my artistic integrity, and people called me weak and self-censoring and, uh, self and a spineless coward. And for maybe a week, this was a huge amount of the email that I received. It was so hateful and so angry. And again, I'm in a mindset where I need to connect with all people. I need to read their emails, uh, to hear their thoughts and, and their pains, and, uh, and get to know their world. So of course, I had to open up every single email and read them all the way through. And I responded to most of them too. I tried to explain myself. I just didn't want them to get the wrong impression about me. Even when I didn't respond, I would still get uh, sucked into the emotions of the email. Like I said, sometimes all you do is you read the subject line and you get pulled into this person's world. Just that small amount. And then you get dozens and dozens of these emails and suddenly all you see when you close your eyes is anger and hatred and the belief that someone else, someone you've never met, is wrong. I had to, I didn't have a choice. The defining motivation was to be recognized by all people. And remember, I was already at the absolute end of my energy. By this point, I was 100% drained by all the communications and emails and interviews and, and, and stuff. So now, the, this next big thing happens and it takes me down to less than nothing. I had less than nothing to give. I felt like less than a person. So here's what happens when you have less than no energy. Normally, I'm someone who enjoys socializing, being around good friends, and making regular connections, communications with people in my life. Suddenly, in the weeks after launch, I disconnected myself from everyone. I didn't even realize I was doing it. Uh, the way that it occurred to me at the time was that suddenly, some, some, uh, all at once, everyone was intentionally trying to piss me off. I remember once I was sitting uh, at a table in our living room, and one of my roommates came up and put a cup down on the table, and I had felt that the table ought to be my personal space. And I remember he put the cup down and, uh, and the thought that went through my head, I became furious and I'm thinking to him, how could you? You really hate me. You really want me to be miserable, don't you? That's the mentality that I was in. I had less than no energy for anyone in my life. So even the remotest intrusion into my personal space equated to a complete and total assault on my very being. I was shutting myself down in order to protect myself, in order to try to get myself away from the onslaught of opinion and feelings that I had allowed myself to be subjected to. It was a defense mechanism against myself. Of course, I wouldn't have put it that way at the time, but looking back, I realized that I was trying to protect myself from my own need to please everyone. Mm. <clears throat> so I was already in this mindset and in the process of withdrawing from the world, when the end of the year rolls around and all of the media outlets start handing out Game of the Year awards. Um, now, I wrote a blog post about this a year ago, so some of you may already be familiar with it, so I'll try to be brief. Basically, if you've ever thought that you aren't obsessing enough over your self-image and what strangers think of you, can I recommend getting yourself nominated for a long string of Game of the Year awards? It'll really put the fear of judgment in you. Uh, I would obsess over every single award and nomination, I would read each of them frantically, looking for Stanley Parable. Every single other game on the list was totally meaningless to me. And honestly, Stanley Parable was pretty meaningless to me too. I, I, I would barely even read the little like quotes that they'd include alongside the nomination or the award or whatever. All that I was here to do was just to make sure that we're on the list. I didn't even get that much joy from seeing it on the list. It's like a drug where eventually you're just taking it to not feel awful, you know? And of course, being addicted to something just to keep yourself from feeling awful is itself a profoundly awful experience. And again, you might say to yourself, but Davey, why don't you just not read Game of the Year awards? And again, the answer to this very simple sounding question is because it's what I had wanted from the beginning. From the beginning, I wanted to be recognized in shows and festivals. I wanted news outlets to talk about me and my work. I had assumed that all of it was good. And so when, I started, so when I started getting it, it did not occur to me that I might stop reading them. So let me reiterate that. It literally did not occur to me that I might not read award nominations, turn down interviews, ignore emails. It was straight up not a part of the world that I was living in. This is the power of your intention. 
Your intention will dictate the things that you think are and are not possible. When what you want most is recognition and not, say, mental health, it will, occur, it will not occur to you to turn down recognition even though it is literally causing you to withdraw from the world in depression. When I was younger, I always kind of laughed at the idea of being addicted to something. You know, like cigarettes, right? It just seemed ridiculous. If you want to, you know, if you don't want to smoke cigarettes, then just throw them out. Or, you know, like just don't go and buy cigarettes, right? How hard could that be? But in being addicted to praise for my work, I learned in a very real and very brutal way that you physically do not have a choice. You've surrendered your decision-making power to something else that you signed a contract with years ago. A contract which declared with authority that praise and connecting with people are the most important things above all else. You really thought that at the time. The game of the year stuff ended, but then I agreed to do all of this traveling, most of it work-related. And remember, this is shortly after the game came out, and for most of that time I've just been doing support for the game, so I've not taken a break from work. For three months at the beginning of 2014, I was in a different city uh, on average every four days. I said yes to everything. I agreed to go everywhere, to be at every event, to talk to every person who would have me. I had zero energy, and I continued to say yes to everything. To talk to every per uh, that's how binding the contract is. Uh, always say yes, respond to every person. I'm sure it's obvious to all of you now how awfully I was treating myself, and of course it's obvious to me as well, but at the time you're so deep inside of it that there's no way you can possibly see it going on. Halfway through traveling, I got sick and remained sick for two straight months, well after I had gotten back home. My body was physically unable to take any more. I got back home to Austin and for the first time in months allowed myself to just stay in one spot. But I was still paying the consequences of everything that I had put myself through. Now that I was no longer moving around and distracting myself from myself, I had to deal with the fact that I was completely withdrawn and depressed. During this time, I would have wild mood swings every single day. One day I would feel okay, then suddenly for two straight days I would feel absolutely nothing, no emotion, nothing whatsoever. Then the next day it would just be sadness, you know, like nothing but sadness all day. Every single day was unpredictable. I had basically no control over my emotional well-being. Uh, Robin, who's my roommate and one of my best friends, uh, I started treating him really badly. I felt like everything that he did that he was trying to do to hurt me personally. I thought of him as lazy and sloppy and irresponsible, and I would tell him that. I would point out his character flaws to him, you know, like suggest ways that he might be more likable. Now keep in mind, Robin and I were best friends uh, for over a year before this. We live and work together. He did the sound design on Stanley Parable. He was and, and is the, one of the closest people in my life, which is perhaps why I unleashed my anxieties on him. And then that summer, uh, almost a year ago, uh, or a little under a year ago, uh, he pulled me aside one day and sat me down and told me that when he was around me, when I was in the same room, that it made him feel physically ill. And that's when I realized, for the very first time, what a shitbag I was being. I didn't realize up until this point how out of hand it had gotten, how really awful I was being to myself. It took nine months since the game came out. And I started to figure it out, and with the help from friends, I started to get myself back on the right path. And eventually, about a month or two later, I started going to therapy, and that's when my life really turned around, and, uh, and I started to exercise the anger and to remember that I'm actually a good person. And I made it back out of the hole. And today, I'm far happier than I ever was before any of that, because I realized how incredibly important it is to treat myself well. And, and I really started doing it. I started to actually treat myself well. I stopped doing basically all interviews or going on shows. I removed myself entirely from Twitter and social media. I began turning down opportunities to travel and give talks, though obviously not all of them. Uh, but I started doing all of the things that I should have done months ago. It took that level of depression and anger and making life hell for the people around me to realize that perhaps, maybe, maybe, Every single opportunity for praise and talking to people and every single person, bringing every single person into my life was not necessarily a healthy outlook on life. Uh, and I'm sure that for many people that actually is totally sustainable, right? A lot of people do have the energy for that. I don't. But for whatever reason, I had it in my head that I did. So why? This is the big question, right? Whenever anyone goes through something traumatic, you always look back and you want to understand why it happened. 
And I'm not going to stand here and pretend that I have an exact answer for you and that if you just do this one thing, then you'll never get depressed, right? But I do think there's one pretty central thing that brought a lot of this pain down on me. A big part of why I was making games in the first place was to be loved in a way that I did not feel I could be loved without my work. I felt that, like, this is, like, this is the way it goes. I, as a creative person, can cultivate a certain amount of love and happiness, you know, like, like me being with people, and then I make work, and then it's up to my work to do the rest, right? Like, I do half, my work does half. And so I'm thinking, uh, as I'm making Stanley Parable, you know, I'm thinking to myself, when I put this out, you know, people who already know me, sure, they'll see the work, and then they'll see me, and then they'll really know me. And then they'll get me because I put so much of myself in this game. And then I'll get the full 100%. You know, I'll get to really connect with people. Then they'll really like me once they play my game. I needed to be loved so badly that I would willingly hurt myself to get it. I would give far more energy than I actually had. I would wear myself to the bone and then keep going. I would be incredibly depressed and still respond to interviews. That's how important it was. OK, cool. That's my big shitty story of how sad I was. Um, sorry about that. Uh, I realize that I've taken you through this long excruciating tale of my life and okay, you all get it, I was very unhappy and everything sucked, which is true. But there's something here that I think is very important and it has nothing to do with how depressed I got. The reason I had to face all of these issues is not because Stanley Parable sold a lot of copies. The biggest thing that made my situation unique is that the reception to Stanley Parable forced all of these things into my life in a very, very short period of time. For most human beings, these are the kinds of issues that you tackle and unravel over the course of many years, or even several decades. In my case, I had to deal with it all in nine months. And that is the only or the biggest meaningful difference, I believe, between me and someone whose work does not like sell well when it comes to this kind of depression. It was hell because I was dealing with the trauma in ultra fast forward. So some of you might have a deeper reason for making games that was very similar to mine, but you'll experience it in a very different way. Because even if you don't have like a hit game or something like that, you still have this contract inside of you that tells you why you're really making whatever it is that you're making, what the deeper reason for it is. Just as it was praise and validation for me, Perhaps for you, it's the need to prove yourself to someone who thinks you won't make it, or a self-judgment that the only people who are valuable in this world are the people who are churning out creative content all the time, or a desire to be a part of a community, to belong to a group of people who you can connect with and be inspired by, or the fan response. Do the people who play your game love it and spend hundreds of hours on it? You know, you get such a rush from that. Or winning awards, or making money. Maybe you just want to be able to support yourself financially. And of course, these are things that apply mostly to games. There are many things, other things that uh, many of you are doing. Um, and maybe, you know, like me, you, you just want people to recognize you personally and tell you that they like your work, and so therefore they like you. There's always something, or multiple things. Everyone has this, whether you know it or not. You are developing and refining this reason every single day and with every single thing that you create. This is the contract that I mentioned earlier. This is the internal voice that has decided what is the most important thing. That whenever you come to a big decision, your internal contract will always privilege this one thing above all others. To you, it doesn't even occur to you as a contract. You know, it just occurs to you as the truth. It's possible that you might not even realize that your other people's contracts are different than yours. But everyone has this, this reason. And the unfortunate reality is that for almost everyone, the contract tends to make decisions from, from a place of fear. Fear that you'll never be enough, fear that you will never have enough, fear that you will never be truly, truly loved, fear that you will never fit in. And whenever the voice of fear gets what it wants, it goes stronger and hotter and it becomes more sure of itself. And when it grows big enough and powerful enough, it will eat you alive because you'll no longer be making decisions for yourself. The only decisions that you will be able to make are those that serve the needs and fit the guidelines of the contract. Now just to insert a little side note here, I realize that I didn't do a very good job of explaining why this unconscious voice is really the voice of fear. If you didn't quite make that connection with me, that's totally understandable. Unfortunately, that single idea that your unconscious and default state of mind tends to be fear-based is such a massive conversation that we could really only cover it adequately by having a completely separate talk about it. So I have to kind of just gloss over it and ask you to just roll with it for now. Perhaps in another time we'll be able to give that conversation 
conversation the attention that it deserves. So back to this idea of a deeper reason. <clears throat> if it happens that in your creative life, your work is received incredibly well in an incredibly short period of time, I have good news. You're going to figure out very quickly what your internal contract actually says. However, if you don't have this experience, as, as many of you will not, that doesn't mean the contract isn't there. It just means that more likely, it will reveal itself to you very slowly in small chunks. Some of you will experience all the pain that I've described here and more, except in tiny pieces over many years, disguised as other things. Always, the contract will tell you that the pain is so small and hardly even worth thinking about, and it's probably you know, a result of some other unrelated thing that you don't even have control over. And when the unrelated thing goes away, then so will the pain. And you'll get great at ignoring it or, explain, or explain, explaining it away to yourself over many years. Uh, and over many years, the pain of subservience to your contract will become background noise in your life, as much a part of your identity as your name or your skin color. From time to time, it will emerge in slightly larger ways by like pissing off a good friend or by taking on a project that you know is wrong for you or by falling into a life habit that is clearly self-destructive. But you won't know why you did those things because it wasn't you making the choice to do that. It was the contract and the contract is always right, always there, always in charge. Sooner or later, you're going to have to deal with this. Sooner or later, the thing that you really want, that you really prize deep down inside, is going to make its way into your life in a way that you did not intend. And even though you didn't get to decide whether or not to have this contract, you do get a choice in how you're going to respond to it. You can start right now, today, by asking yourself, what is the real reason that I'm doing what I'm doing? Why am I making stuff? You don't even have to come up with an answer to it because many of you are still in school and you're learning what the hell to actually do with yourself in the first place and maybe it's not even games. And here, I, I really do need to urge you to be patient with yourselves when dealing with this stuff. There are no shortcuts. It actually just takes a long time. But the cool part about this is that if you keep asking yourself this question, eventually you will get a response back from the unconscious part of your mind that knows what your deeper reason really is. This is actually super cool. If you ask this question thoughtfully and deliberately and repeatedly without forcing any kind of answer onto it, you'll actually just be given the answers over time. I realize that I have no way of proving this to you, uh, so you kind of just have to take my word for it, but it's the oldest trick in the book. It's encoded into our collective mythology in broad silly truisms like free your mind and the rest will follow which of course we all ignore because who has any idea how to just free your mind as though it were that simple. But I will suggest to you today that freedom of mind is a result of nothing other than just asking this question over and over and over, what is the deeper purpose? It's a practice that you will come back to every single day. Every single day, you will be given many opportunities to just jump to the most obvious, the most fearful, the most unengaged state of mind in small, tiny ways that you won't even notice. The default unthinking behavior encoded into you by your contract. Even me, even while I was writing this talk, like I kept having this image popping into my head of like I'm delivering this speech to you and, and, you know, and people are video recording this and it, I, I guess it gets put out on the internet and then when it does, it becomes this big viral hit. And throughout the video game community, I'm recognized for my incredible wisdom and my endless virtue and compassion for the human spirit. And no, wait, what if it wasn't just the gaming community? What if it was like Ted came to me to like give this talk, you know, like on their main stage? And then what if that goes mainstream and it turns out to be the most popular and inspirational video on their website? Oh my God, I would be so loved. I would be so adored, appreciated. I would be seen so clearly. It would be so beautiful. This is my contract. It is not me. It is my default state of mind. It does not have my health in its interests, nor my relationships, nor actual real wisdom. Only the one thing, the one thing of which it will never ever have enough. All that this voice knows how to do is consume. And the test is whether I or you, every single day when this voice arises, whether we can simply meet it with awareness to see it for what it is, and to continue asking, what do I really want? You can break this unconscious default behavior if you come back to it 
and ask this question over and over, you will discover a relief that is deeper and more lasting and more nourishing than any relief you have ever experienced in your life. Or, on the other hand, you don't have to. You can allow the contract to make your decisions for you. You can produce work that is not coming from you, but from a voice in your head with a singular and unquestioned point of focus. You will send art out into the world that is born not from a place of compassion and love and empathy, but from a place of fear that you will never be or have enough. Other people out there in the world will experience this work that you've made, and they'll be persuaded that this is how the world is. They slowly over time will begin to see the world through the fearful lens that you've offered to them, a lens that tells them that they are not good enough, or to run from their pain rather than confront it, or to be scared of people who are different from them. And when we have enough game developers creating video games from this unquestioned and fearful state of mind, when we have trained our audiences to demand games which come from the unquestioned and fearful state of mind, then over several decades, we develop an art form in which by far the most ubiquitous form of expression is that of firing a gun. We get a culture where violence is understood and implied to be the central means of problem solving, and so enemies must be made inhuman, ethnically threatening to a white Western audience, living beings made dispensable in the hundreds or thousands purely so that violence can continue to be palatable and marketable. We get a culture where women are frequently depicted as fragile and in need of rescue, and where sex is not represented as an act of intimate humility before another human being, but a reward at the end of a series of correct or incorrect gameplay decisions. We get a culture where players expect to be made unambiguous heroes, whose actions have permanent and lasting impact at all times, where the repercussions of one's actions are minimized or removed entirely, so as to keep the player immersed in the narrative that you, and only you, are the single most important human being in the entire universe. In short, we deny our players their humanity, for our humanity cannot be seen in the things that we gain. It is seen in how we respond to not getting what we want. This is what I hope for the works that you make. I hope for all of you to create works that allow your players to feel more human, but it is so, so hard to do when that one voice, that one contract is making all of your decisions for you. This is what is at risk. If you fail to be conscious about what's going on in your head, this is what you risk doing to yourself, and it's what you risk doing to other people. Because, oh my God, I want you to treat yourselves so well. I want you to be good to yourselves. This is surprisingly difficult, but you can do it with patience and attention. And then when you're being good to yourself, you tend to be good to other people. You tend to make things that encourage the kind of compassion and empathy that I mentioned earlier. I really want you all to treat yourselves like you deserve to be treated well because you do. And I'm gonna finish my talk today by returning to and reiterating on a point that I made earlier, which is that in order to do this, you have to be patient with yourself. I know that's not a sexy takeaway, but it's maybe the closest thing that I can offer you to a real solution for dealing with your own personal contract. Ask this question of yourself. Ask what is the deeper reason why you're making games, and then be patient and allow the answers to come to you. It's the hardest thing to do because it is the very definition of delayed gratification. But as you're going to discover over and over again throughout your lives, the most difficult crucibles to traverse are the ones that offer the most deeply fulfilling rewards on the other end. On the surface, patience looks invisible. It looks like you're doing nothing. But really, what you are doing is choosing not to be driven by the voice of fear. You're instead choosing to listen to it and hear what it has to say and then say, okay, cool, thank you, voice in my head, and then continue to ask, why do I really want to make what I'm making? Patience means doing this over and over and over, your entire life. It's the only way to break from your contract, and I promise you that over time, you will do exactly that. You'll develop the strength to choose for yourself and to choose a life where you treat yourself and others well. And then, when this is your mindset, you'll be able to create such beautiful pieces of work. You'll make games that teach the world to be joyful and compassionate, and you'll feel really good about yourself besides. I really do wish this upon every single one of you, whether you're making video games or something else entirely, whether you're a doctor or a geologist or a cashier, 
I wish you the ability and the patience to be kind to yourself. In my opinion, it's one of the most important skills that you can develop. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Um, right, so I know that I just, that, that's the whole big and, and weird and personal and everything, but we do have time for Q&A, and I, I definitely don't want to, like, scare people off from asking questions about, like, game development or story or narrative or, or design, if that is, like, a thing that you want to know about or any, anything else, but uh, is there anything we have to do? Oh, no? Is that a microphone? Uh, that's awesome. Hello. Okay. Um, yeah, you talked about the negatives of um, being a celeb, I guess. Of uh, a celeb. Is that is that what? <laughs> Celebrity. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right, right. Um, do you think it's even possible in general for um, an indie developer or a small developer to um, be successful and not have that kind of personal spotlight? Yeah, absolutely. You just never hear about those people. Right. And and do, do you have a do you have like a plan for your next project? Like, are, are you going to hire someone for PR or whatever? Uh, I'm going to do it better. I, I don't know. I mean, I would. Um, it's a it's kind of a whole issue that deserves to be tackled on its own, I think. I mean, I feel that way about marketing and promotion in general. I think that, that it deserves to be treated like it's, a, like it's a whole facet of your game, you know, the way that art or sound is a facet of your game. Okay, how are we going to, like, market and promote it? And, you know, part of that is, like, what are the actual logistical things that we have to deal with as far as getting the word out and, you know, make, getting people to know about a game? And part of it is, am I treating myself well as I'm doing that, which I guess is a part of, of everything, right? Even art and sound and design, like, just kind of like, are you, are you being good to yourself? But I think especially for a lot of people, uh, a lot of people understand how to make their work so well that then when it comes to marketing and promotion and dealing with the rest of the world, that, uh, that we don't, we're, because we often don't treat it like it is its own actual thing that deserves to be like handled well, then we kind of like half-ass it, right? And we're not really thinking about how to, how to be good to ourselves. So, um, you know, the important thing for me right now is to make a, something work on things that, that are important to me and be good to myself and like not think about that yet, right? And not figure that out and kind of be like, okay, that needs to be given like my full attention and to be focused on. Uh, and, and to be treated with, with concern. Uh, so wh when we get to that point, I'll probably, yeah, I'll probably like, have other people to do like email, you know, like relations with, with, um, with, w with folks or to be more public facing in a way so that I can you know, disengage. Um, but I'm, I'll figure that out as its own distinct and separate problem. Well, while we're waiting, if somebody else wants to um, ask something, uh, I found it funny that I guess Stanley Parable's narrative is kind of a, when it brings you to a kind of a meta level, uh, and now in your talk you kind of went to a meta level also. Uh, but it would be interesting to hear. Um, no one's ever called me meta before. That's very <laughs> okay. funny. Uh, uh, but anyway, I would like to ask um, the. Um, you were saying that um, when making Stanley Parable, you kind of wanted to put something of yourself mm -hmm. into the game, and that would kind of make people see you and all, all that stuff. So um, would you maybe want to tell something more about what exactly do you feel of yourself that you put into the game, and, uh, and what, um, what was the point? <laughs> or, um, well, I guess you told the point is, but... Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, it's obviously it's a big, it's a, a pretty um, complex kind of whirlwind of of emotions. Um, it, it was tough because I was, I you know, I started it when I was, uh, I started working on the original thing when I was 
20 or 21, and then we released the, the new version when I was 25. And that's like a pretty big, that's a pretty significant chunk of, of a person's life, you know? So you're, you're a pretty different person when you're 20 than, than when you're 25. And so by the end of it, there were a lot of things about the game that were like, oh, this, re this really was me right back then, and now it's kind of me, but I feel very differently about these things than I used to. Uh, I, I, you know, I think that the, the core of the game was kind of cynical and sarcastic uh, in a way that by the time that, that we launched, I didn't, feel, I didn't feel as nearly as cynical, but um, we, you know, we, I, I guess this is the irony of saying that I wanted people to really know like who I was. It's a very muddled, you, you, you become very emotionally confused by that. Like, wait, is this really me? Um, I think that I was, I had much more of a, of a um, sense, which, and I, I think that this is a result of, of growing up well to do and not really having that many actual real problems in your life is that you kind of make up problems for yourself along the lines of like, well, what if none of it means anything, right? And, you know, I, I know a lot of young people go through this, and I think one of my ways of doing that was making a game where you wander infinite hallways and everything contradicts one another and there is no real meaning to anything, and haha, -ha, think about that now for a bit, right? Um, I think that was very true of me when I was 20. Um, these days I would not say it's, I mean, what I, what I, you know, care about more is more along the lines of, of what I just said here, which is like when you do actually go through something difficult and something that really challenges you, it kind of like focuses you, you in, or in my experience it does. It kind of makes you go like, oh, wait, no, they're actually, like I know I did this thing about how like, oh, none of it means anything, and look how silly all of, all of life is. Um, but I, I definitely have a much, I'm, I'm a lot more focused, I, I think, today um, so, uh, you know, maybe, maybe the biggest thing that I wanted to see from people was like, I'm confused and I don't get what all of this is for, but like maybe you get that too and so therefore, you know, like I feel kind of alone because I feel like I'm having to deal with all of these questions in my head and so maybe you are too and so then maybe we'll have something to, to talk about and, uh, you know, I, I, I gave a long talk about where, where that, that went, but I think that was the biggest thing that I was hoping for was like, being able to relate to other people who also feel confused and disoriented and who are also trying to, trying to synthesize meaning out of that but don't really know how. Um, and comedy, there's comedy in it too. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's also important to me. But, um, Hey, uh, to do a little se uh, segue from comedy, mm -hmm. uh, how do you feel, uh, Stanley Parable is a, is a funny game. How do you feel Thank about, you. Uh, how, how do you think about the connection between playfulness and games? And, and is it humor? Well, humor is a great way to do it, you know, mostly because there is almost no humor in video games. Right, like if you look at the like, what's the the film industry's like big giant AAA thing? It's like Transformers or something, right? And Transformers is full of jokes. There's like humor the whole way out. They're pulling gags and telling one-liners and everything, right? And our big AAA thing is like Call of Duty, and Call of Duty is just like the you know most like dead-on, straightforward, you know, no time for jokes kind of thing. So. I, I don't really know why that is, um, but it is definitely, it's, it's especially concerning to me as far as like uh, bringing the culture of games to people who are not just our like little bubble, because everyone gets humor. You know, humor is like such a universal thing. It's the way that, it's the thing that gets you to like let down your guard, right? You know, when, when, you, when you're laughing at something, that's like your way of saying, oh, things are okay, right? You know, it's safe. Here I don't I don't need to be so so cautious. And in Stanley Parable's case, that was actually really good because what we would do is we we actually kind of figured out this formula that um, sort of like late in development we realized that we were doing this one very specific thing over and over, which was like um, 
send people down this path, and then throw a joke at them, right? And then give them some like little humorous thing to interact with, right? And then throw another joke at them, and then kind of bring that together in this weird kind of funny set piece, right? And let them hang around in that for a while. And then it would switch, and it would get like super dark and super serious and super like existential crisis mode. Uh, but like because of all of that comedy, it really like let people let their guards down, and it kind of like welcomed. They were willing to like welcome the game in and be like, "Oh, okay, you're you're safe. You're a friend. You know, you we can uh, we can have an actual conversation here." Um, you know, which I guess is a little bit manipulative, but it wasn't. It wasn't the intention. It was more like we realized we realized late in development that you could you could totally do that, um, and I. I uh, I, it's very hard, you know, you can write interesting jokes and like put jokes in the game to actually create like playfully humorous interactions with your, with a game system is something we basically don't understand at all how to do. We have a few good examples, right? It's kind of like, you know, uh, uh, scientists being given alien technology from another, like pieces of it, right? And being like, well, I get that it works, but I have no idea how, right? I feel like that's our, that's our collective relationship to, to comedy right now. Um, so I, I, I don't really understand either, you know, that, I mean, like we put, like I wrote so many things for Stanley Parable that I was like, people are gonna love this, it's gonna be great. And then we put players in front of it like we would, we, I would write sections where it was like you were walking down like a corridor, or standing in a room, and there'd be the narrator would be like telling you jokes and like, ah, oh, push this thing over here, right? How you know, look, how have fun with this, and then people would play it and come back to me and be like, Davy, that was awful, because you just made me sit in a room listening to you talk. Like this, no one wants that. No one wants to be locked in a room and made to hear your shitty jokes, you know. Uh, <laughs> So I guess, I guess the point is like, I don't know. I have no idea. Um, we just did it until it, we just did it over and over until it worked. Um, and there's, like I said, there's, there's the alien technology where you could probably reverse engineer some of it, be like, well, I think it's because of that. Um, but what I, what, what I suspect or what I hope is just that it'll take time and, you know, over, over years or decades, we'll actually develop that language. And, and I mean, I guess the reason I hope that is because uh, I hope that, I think it's, one of the, the key ways to um, bring people into our culture from outside of it, people who don't already have the familiarity with controls or mechanisms or whatever because, oh, okay, it's not about that. It's about I'm supposed to laugh. I'm supposed to let my guard down. And then when we, when we communicate that to people and when that's how people see games, then we'll be, I think, you know, doing a lot better than we are doing right now. Yeah. Is that? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. yeah. Cool. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, I have um, more, more of a comment uh, mm -hmm. instead of a question. Uh, I've been thinking about this um, indie games being, uh, I mean, the, the one uh, strength of the indie games are them being personal. Uh, what I mean is that, uh, like in uh, Stanley Parable, you're coming from a personal experience and it's uh, more of a form of expression compared to mainstream games where the major point is being en entertained. Well, it's of course a generalization, but uh, that's how I see in general the, the mm, indie games and mainstream games. And that's, that, that, that is leading to uh, the risk of uh, taking the feedback very pers on a very personal level it, because you're, you're uh, putting a lot of personal input in it. So I was thinking maybe the troubles you had after the game was uh, successful, it's because that you you were taking everything so personally, and e everything you hear about it uh, meant so much to you. I mean, uh, do you think this is uh, something that uh, indie developers should <laughs> um, be careful about? Because I mean, um, maybe it applies to most of these uh, creative fields, not not only game development. Yeah, it's 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 very hard. You know, there's no clear answer to it. It's kind of like, it's kind of like starving and having nothing to eat except like a plate of cookies, but one of them is poisoned, right? And you're like, you, you want feedback and you want to know what people are are gonna think of you, but then one of them is just gonna ruin you, 
right? And you don't know which one. You don't know where it's going to happen. But the rest of them taste so good, you know, that, and you're so hungry, right, that you're like, oh, of course it's worth it. Um, there's, it's, it's just going to be so different for every single person who comes to that, to that place. I'm, I'm trying to think. I, I feel like, um, I guess I was trying to, to sort of think about other mediums and how other mediums handle it. And honestly, I'm not sure that there is like a healthy way that, that people handle it. Like, I think one of the, the ways that we kind of culturally romanticize writers, for example, right, is the idea of the writer like going away to their little hut in the woods somewhere and like shutting themselves off from the world and just like firing off like, you know, a thousand pages of, of genius and then coming back and like sharing it with the world and then just like being like, no, I have no comment, you know. Which, which I mean, is is kind of the way to get around the issue that you're talking about, but it also sets up a lot of kind of conversely difficult problems where, you know, maybe a writer um, feels that, they're ought to that they ought to seclude themselves, that that's like the correct way to create genius works, but they don't want to, right? They're like, no, I don't want to, like they're trying, maybe they, they're, they're replicating, you know, methods that other people have used because like that's what we say is the, the sexy thing to do, but that's not right for them. You know, um, and like I said, you know, there are many people who I know for a fact make games and then go out and have this relationship with people. I don't know if anyone knows Rami from Blambeer. That that I, that guy is like he's he. When I said like that period of my life where I was traveling every four days and I became miserable, that's just his life, right? And he just does that forever, and he has energy for it. And I don't know where he where he gets it from. And I I guess the 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 only real way to answer that is like, well, it's got to be what's true for you, right? Like, I can't, I can't look at Rami and how Rami handles like relation, relating to people because he lets almost all of it in. He knows when to cut it off, but he lets like a insane amount of it of it in. And as soon as I start trying to, you know, replicate his process for myself, then I'm done because it's not going to be about what I actually want or need. Um, and so I, I guess, I think that collectively we probably have to skew a little bit more toward, um, like as indie developers, you know, I think that I would like to encourage people to be healthy. And that, go, that extends to like, you know, how long is your development cycle? You know, people jumping into these like five year projects and murdering themselves over it. Well, maybe that's not healthy for everyone, right? Or uh, any number, you know, we've, there's ev plenty of examples of like, oh, so and so obviously didn't, you know, handle things super well in that situation, but um, I, 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 I hope that the biggest thing that we can encourage is, is just well, you got to be honest with yourself, right? Like when you try to to do that, and then you got a really bad response from yourself. Well, you got to actually like take that into account and and adjust yourself, right? And maybe say like, oh, I, you know, uh, I, I'm not my work, right? or not as much as I thought I was. Maybe it's not so important to me that everything that responds, that's a response to my work be a comment on me. Um, and that's a very hard thing to actually, you know, like, like I, I said, the only, the only solution to that is just patience and coming back to that over and over and over over time. It does change. You do actually start to shift it, but you got to start with, hey, the way that I'm, the way that I'm relating to, the way that I'm treating all of my feedback as though it is m about me, I'm getting some pretty clear responses here from my brain and my body that that's not good for me, right? So I, I guess that's the most important thing, and that's what I've, that kind of like self-searching and being genuine with yourself and saying, understanding that your other people's solution is not your solution uh, is probably the most important thing, but that's way less big and sexy to talk about than like, look how famous you can get from making your indie games, right? Uh, unfortunately, it's the harder narrative to convey, um, but we'll get there. Is that, how does, was that along the lines you were thinking? Oh, good, 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 cool. I'll have a second go. Uh, how do you approach um, interactive storytelling, like uh, Stanley Par Stanley Parable, is a, is a game 
in which I think almost everyone uh, experiences in a different way. Do you, how, how did you write it? How did you want to write it? And, and how did it end up? Um, in bits and pieces, I guess, is the only way to... The, the, the structure of the, of the game um, is so... Like, one of the strengths and weaknesses of, of Stanley Parable is that the structure is basically like, it just goes over here, then goes over here, then goes over here, then goes over here. Um, and my intention with starting from that design was not that we be able to, you know, then therefore get away with being very sloppy and lazy about designing it, but we were able to be kind of sloppy and lazy about designing it in that, uh, like, oh, we could work on this little thing, and then, oh, we're bored of that, or it's just not working, all right, whatever, we'll just go and do this for a while, right? Um, and then because you go do this for a while, and then you do this, and then you do this, and you finally get them up to where they're pretty good, and then you go back and look at this thing over here, and go like, oh, now it's shit, right? We've spent so, we've, we've, I've learned so much, and this would happen like every six months over development. Uh, we would look back at the thing, the, the thing we'd been making six months before, and gone like, oh, God, how could we have thought we, that would be shippable, right? We would go back and we would tinker that and, and do it over again. Um, and that's a part of why, I mean, we could have done the game in half the time, I'm sure, if we had just stuck with the, the, the first ideas, you know, that we'd come up with. Um, so I, 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 that answer, it's very, my answer to this is very specific to Stanley Parable because most games, probably, you can't get away with that. Like, I, th I think, especially because we also didn't have a lot of systems, uh, gameplay systems underlying that, where, you know, changing one thing over here might break the system over here. It was, it was actually just like, no, those are like completely separate things. Um, so, it, you know, the problem with that is that you don't, re you, you surrender the ability to convey a single straightforward idea in the same way, not without, not without like really stepping back and going like, all right, even, you know, I mean, there are plenty of like fractured narratives out there, but the ones that really, I think the ones that convey a, a really solid idea are the ones where the person creating it or whoever steps back and says, okay, I have all these things that I'm talking about, but how do I get these all to convey something and to communicate something? Um, and I'm not quite sure that we did that with Stanley. Maybe we, I guess it just depends on, it depends on the person. And at a certain point, I realized, I, like at a certain point in development, I was like, I know that we're not really going to be able to cohere these into a super beautiful way, but people seem to be responding well to it, right? People seem to be getting something out of it. Um, and like I said, I think that just has to do with like my sensibilities changing over time. At the beginning, it was probably just like, yeah, no, there is no point, right? <clears throat> None of it matters. You don't need to have any, any idea. And I think by, you know, like I said, by the time you're like 25, you're like, I would kind of like an idea. You know, I would like some kind of takeaway here, but it was sort of too late because what are you gonna do? Like go back and rechange? No, you ship your goddamn game, right? Like it was just more important to actually like get it out of the way and then be like, okay, cool. I'll, we'll get this out, and then we'll go on and work on something that maybe is a little bit more clearer and straightforward. And I mean, the the problem there is that then every you know everything that you make has to actually fit, and you can't just do this like I think I'll work on this for a while. I think I'll work on that for a while, and swing your arms back and forth. Um, so yeah, it's 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 very specific to this particular game, and it's not really how I want to make games going forward because it was so, like, I have no idea how far we are or close to what, I don't even know what we're trying to achieve, right? Like, that was, it was just like, I don't know, just add a thing. Do people like it? Yeah, I don't know why. Okay, cool, ship it. Um, it was fun. It's kind of like a punk band. You know, it's kind of like just getting to, in your garage and just like, all right, cool, I guess this sounds good. Yeah, let's go play it, right? Um, but, you know. Punk bands are for the young. I'm old now. Yeah. Okay. I think we'll thank David one, once more. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs>
It was good having you. Cool. Maybe I'll say some ending words now as this is the last lecture. No. Um, so thank you for following this. And uh, as usual, those of you who are actually physically here, come join us for a little chat and have some coffee uh, after the lecture now. And uh, maybe a little word of marketing now also. So uh, those of you who might be interested in joining more of other university game courses, maybe do the minor in game design and production, or even come and do MA studies uh, or Master of Science studies here at other university. Um, the applications to the minor subject uh, studies will be open, I think, uh, in the start of next month, and then the actual application to the master's program will be then, I think, December, uh, so some time still for that. Um, but keep that in mind if you'd like to study more uh, game stuff here. And uh, also, next year, or next academic year, we'll continue with the Game Snow lecture series. Uh, so stay tuned, and I hope I'll see many of you doing the course with new interesting topics starting from next autumn. All right, but thank you, thank you, and join us, and if you didn't put your name on the list, please do. Thank you. Thank you everyone for having me.